Welcome everyone to another Total Education Centre Lecture. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about Miranda from The Tempest. And it's, it's an interesting thing with Miranda because she's the only female character in The Tempest and it's very important to get a good grip on what she's doing and what she's saying. Of course everybody here in Australia for my overseas viewers is now on holidays and, and we're filming this from Melbourne, a very different from where we normally are in my home. But let's talk about Miranda. And I'm going to do this lecture in a couple of parts. I'm going to talk generally about Miranda probably for the first third or so. Then I'm going to talk about a few critical reviews and a few perceptions and different analyses of Miranda in the play over time and put them in context and some production work. And then finally I'm going to talk about some very specific things about Miranda and Discovery. So that's the general play of the lecture. What I'll do this time also is I'm going to read some, some critical analysis from the net and I'll put all the websites and reviews and those people um, that I talk about, I'll put those in the notes at the end. So make sure you look at those notes at the end because often they're quite a good synopsis of what's happening. Alright, don't forget if you do like this lecture, click the like button down below and give us a bit of thanks for that. And um, if you have any other comments and you don't like it, also just make a comment and let us know and we can change it and adapt it. Alright, let's talk about Miranda. Miranda, of course, is Prospero's daughter, and as I said before, she's the only female character in the play, and this has led to a lot of, um, of course, feminist analysis, which I'll talk about later. She's a very virtuous character and, and, and quite naive in many ways, and when you think about the situation that she's been in, we can understand her naivety. Um, Prospero is the only really human contact she's had, other than Caliban. I'll talk about that later, but you can imagine the sort of upbringing she's had on the island alone, isolated, never seen another woman... Um, has only really had Prospero, her father, as an educator. And it's a very sort of different lifestyle and different education that she's had. And we need to remember that, of course, that the island's very magical. In, in, and so she's picked up little, little things on the way through that would help her. She's completely unsophisticated. And, and by unsophisticated, I mean that she has no experience of court. And so in many ways, she, she's unsophisticated, but she brings something else to the play and that, that naivety is very catchy and alluring to some, especially Ferdinand. Um, she's innocent, but she's aware of Cal Caliban's evil. And I, I direct you to um, Act 1, Scene 2, Lines 352 and 62 to show that she has learned something on the way and she's not completely naive. And she says, Abhorred slave, which any print of goodness wilt not take, being capable of ill, I pitied thee, took pains to make thee speak, toward each other hour. And, and then she goes on, she, she really gives it to him big time and says, what has that deserved more than a prison? And, and that, that's a very interesting thing because it shows that she has some spirit and backbone. And we also see later on that she's not completely, um, as some critics have suggested, completely useless in the play and hopeless. And, and she does say, she does ignore Prospero at times and, and, and all those sorts of things. And we need to give her a little bit of credit for that. And I think she's a little bit more three-dimensional than some of the critics have portrayed. Her role is limited, I must admit, in the play as, as the only female character. Um, yet she has her own sort of scenes in it because her plot line is very different from all the other plot lines. And she, she, she has Ferdinand in that plot line. And, and the marriage is very important and very significant for the unity of the play at the end. And I think her plot line throughout the five acts develops and matures until at the end that we look to her for the hope for the future. Um, <clears throat> the first aspect of probably the, the play in, in terms of discovery that you want to talk, talk about is that she falls in love with Ferdinand and, that, and the discovery of that first boy she sees, the first male she ever sees in her entire life. Um, and to me it's completely irrational and, and the idea that you see someone for the very first time and probably the first other human being that you've ever seen before and you fall immediately in love with her doesn't seem logical and probably doesn't seem realistic but you've got to remember that in the context of the play we're in this new deep emotional wonderful world where magic abounds and all these things are possible and we also need to think about how Prospero is using magic and weaving his magic on her putting her to sleep and waking her up and doing all those sorts of things that that it's nearly believable to some, and you know you like to go along with it anyway because it's part of that romance of the play. And and 
I often get students who say to me, oh, it's, it's a bit puzzling or it's a bit, bit odd that she does this, but I think you've got to go with that idea, that suspension of disbelief, and move on through that. Um, the storm creates that, and I've talked about that in other lectures, and she, um, she, I think, falls in love and deeply in love, and she maintains that and sustains that, and in the end she asks Ferdinand to marry her, which is another interesting thing. When Miranda discovers that love, she's surely smitten and, and stays true to Ferdinand completely, despite the troubles they have and despite Prospero being the dad as such and trying to create trouble and you know gives Ferdinand all these tasks to do and all that. In Act 1, she sees too, the first time she sees Prospero, she says, um, she calls him a spirit, she calls him noble and a thing divine. And, and these go back to her lack of probably worldly experience, but she really does dote on him and see him as something very different and very, you know, unusual in her, in her land. And she does desperately fall in love. As I said before, it's certainly part of her naivety, and she certainly doesn't have any understanding of the world's issues until probably her father explains, Prospero explains to her in that Act 1 about what's happened and gives her all that backstory. We also need to consider her age in the play and, and you know, estimates range from, from 13 to 17. So if you average it out, Miranda's probably about 15 in these scenes. And so she's still a very young teenager and, and certainly very impressionable. And generally, um, she fits the role of women as being passive and subservient in the play. And that's partly Shakespeare's time. And I'll give you a quote later on that talks about that when I move into talking about some of the critical analyses. Um, she, she, she proposes to Ferdinand, and that's probably the moment where she, she's one of her stronger moments in the play, and that's in Act 3, um, Scene 1, lines 83 and 84. And she actually walks up and proposes to him and says, we're gonna, you know, basically, we, sh we should get married. And, and probably Miranda, in, historically, has the most famous lines as well and the most important lines in the play. And that's in Act 5, Scene 1, lines 181 to 80, 183, where she says... How many goodly creatures, oh sorry, it begins, oh wonder, how many goodly creatures there here, how beauteous mankind is, oh brave new world, that has such people in it. And that sort of offers hope for the future, and, and the brave new world obviously has been picked up later on, and, and many critics have used that. And, and it's interesting that the most famous lines in the play probably come from the only female character in that play. And I think that that's something to think about. When we look at the feminist critics and we later on, you know, the different discoveries that people make in their readings of the play, it, it depends on very much on what perspective you come at it. And we need to think very clearly about how we read the play ourselves. Um, th these lines allow, I think that's a very important element of discovery in the play and what, what she brings to the play in terms of discovery because it certainly has hope for a better future in those lines and that's what Miranda's after. Miranda's, Miranda's a softening influence in the play because it is very male dominated and, and, and Shakespeare of course in his context would see a woman in the play as very, that, that softening, that gentle influence in the play and she's the one who brings all those characters together in, in, a, simple, in a simple way very much. But she herself is wondrous at all, the, at all the things she's experiencing over this time. And if you go back to the point I made, she's only 15 and never seen another man, really never seen another woman in her entire life. So all these people landing on the island must be extremely interesting for her and certainly far more exciting than just spending time with the father and Caliban. She also, and critics of, you know, and especially a lot of, a lot of modern critics have criticised her character as as being pretty much just a, a doormat one critic calls her but I don't think that's necessarily true it's true that she isn't is innocent and doesn't have the deceits and tell the lies and the and the plotting of all those people that come from a civilized society and she certainly is more earthy and natural than, than many of the characters and I think that's part of why critics you know, many audiences and critics like Miranda because she is that and does bring those characteristics to it. She, she's been brought up on this magical island. She's completely separate from what we would term the civilised world of Milan. And she's certainly more of a child of nature, more part of that enchanted world. She certainly is untouched by that social etiquette. And 
and courtly ways and, and her joining with Ferdinand at the end allows for very much for that all to come together <clears throat> and those two worlds to be united as one. Um, William Hazlitt in his early critical analysis way back in, in over time calls her a goddess of the isle and talks about her purity of love yet she doesn't always follow a father and I talked about that previously. You also we need to remember that Miranda is desperately and essentially central to the political aspect of the play in that her marriage to Ferdinand brings all the groups together and solves that schism and that, that, that separation between Prospero and Alonso. So what else is there about Miranda that we need to think about? Certainly you need to consider what you discover from the play and what she brings to the play and her, her elements of discovery. I mean. Um, in my notes here I've talked about how different ages and audiences bring unique paradigms of understanding. And if we think about that, for example, modern critics of the play see her, and a feminist reading of the play would see her as, as this. And, and I'll quote this from Malkapur, who writes, and I'll put that, these notes at the end, Prospero becomes the end of patriarchy, and she writes a very fe feminist-based analysis of it in many ways. And she says... Miranda, who is the only female character in the play, has long been the subject of feminist studies. But surprisingly, what drives most feminists into a rage is that the very representation of Miranda in the play, rather than the omission of other female characters, they view Miranda as a prototype of that unlikely invention of Puritan conduct, book authors, and late 20th century scholars, the woman who is chaste, silent, and obedient. Commenting on The Tempest, Dan Thompson asks, What kind of pleasure can a woman and a feminist take in this text beyond the rather grim one of mapping out its various patterns of exploitation? Um, Thompson argues she, that Miranda is passive and unassertive, who willingly submits to father's control of her chastity. Um, and also she goes on to talk about how Miranda is an extremely feeble heroine and, feeble heroine, and scorns identity those who identify with her. She also goes on to talk about how Miranda is controlled and dominated by her father and he, he tells her to obey and be attentive and he repeatedly demands her attention. Uh, and there's two ways to look at that and I think you need to make up your own mind about that. Does she drift away from Prospero because he's just ranting on or does she really go and think about it? I also like you to think about <clears throat> Miranda in terms of production and there's one very specific production obviously that I'd like you to look at. There are many productions on YouTube and if you have searched for this video of course that you'll find that there are copies of The Tempest and productions of The Tempest down the column on the right hand side and you probably should have a look at those but I would direct you to um, <coughs> bibliopolisliveJournal.com 882.72.htlm that talks about Derek Jarman's The Tempest and that's an extremely controversial adaptation of The Tempest and where it places Miranda um, is punk in many ways and I'll just read you a little excerpt from that before I run out of time and it talks about how Miranda he doesn't make her out to be a goddess and she doesn't look like a, a goddess in fact she's not a passive sexual object or, or an ethereal presence. Um, the scene that demonstrates Miranda's lack of sexuality is where she's washing herself. And, and it goes on to talk about very clearly about how um, her, her, the representation takes away her sexuality and that she comes across as a bit primitive and earthy, very much as how you'd expect her to be brought up on an island with only a father figure to represent her. And I, I'll direct you to that in the play because I haven't got time to read it now. The whole thing but I think you'll find that representation of Miranda very interesting and certainly very challenging and, and it's and I would, would point that out to you as a way of discovering a little bit more about Miranda and what Miranda brings to the play and I think you'll find that very interesting. Another aspect I'd like you to think about is what the critics discover in different contexts and I know that goes back deliberately to the syllabus and what we're talking about here but you might want to have a look at what um, Roland Leach says and while this is a little bit probably university level in many ways, I'll read you a very short passage from that before I run out of time, and it'll guide you to that. And I'll put, I'll certainly put these, um, the links in the minute, the notes at the end of the lecture. He says the tempest colludes with the patriarchal and racial values of 17th century Europe. 
though some critics believe that though Caliban, through Caliban's speeches, Shakespeare does show some awareness of the dispossession of indigenous peoples. Nevertheless, the play's stereotypical mapping of gender reinforces and stabilises cultural assumptions of women as passive and aesthetic objects of desire. And he goes on to look at you know, the, the different feminist viewpoints and has an analysis of how we see the Tempest over time. Well, that's all I have time for tonight. I'd like to thank you for, for watching. My name is Bruce Pattinson and, and we hope you enjoyed this lecture. Don't forget to have a look at our website, totaleducation.com.au. I'm going to do another in, lecture in this series and it's going to be about language because most of the questions that I've got off students have been directed about language and techniques in the play and how they develop. So look forward to that. That's the next lecture in the Tempest series and that'll be language and language techniques. Thank you very much for your time. Good night.